we work really hard to make sure that we are creating uh, relevance in your life. And again, this forum is a reflection of that commitment. One of the reasons I, am, I have my UT tie on here today, um, I got a taste of what it's like to be a realtor. I'm not a realtor. Never bought or sold a home. I am so proud to be your association executive. But I got a little taste of what your life is like. One Saturday morning, I'm at an NAR conference, and I'm going down to do at 6 o'clock in the morning what I always do when I'm at a conference. I go to the Starbucks to get a cup of coffee. And I'm on there on a Saturday morning, and Texas is playing West Virginia that day. Now, I am a rabid Longhorn fan. And this would apply to Aggies as well because your network is more committed to each other than even the, the Longhorns are. I know that. But the reality is I go down and I have my, my, my Longhorn shirt on and I get the coffee. And there's this small Italian guy in cutoffs or, or shorts and a T-shirt and flip-flops and, you know, he's just woken up and he looks at me. And this happens if you know all the time. You're, hey, hook him. Hook him. Hey, where are you from? I said, oh, yeah, hook him, man. I'm, I'm from Austin. He goes, he goes, oh, you're from Austin. You're a broker. You're, you know, you're an agent. No, actually, I'm the association. He said, oh, really? You're the association executive. Yeah. He said, you need to meet my best friend, Johnny Johnson. And I went thinking to myself, Johnny Johnson is one of my heroes because I've known him and watched his professional career and knew he came from LaGrange. I know his story. And so I went, yeah, sure, great, yeah, that would be great, I'd love that. And he goes, no, really, um, hang on just a second, give me your name. And he texts, he puts my name into his, you know, message machine. He goes, I'm going to text him right now. I'm going to hook you guys up. You need to go have breakfast. I went, great, cool. So three weeks later, I'm having breakfast with Johnny Johnson. And I'm thinking, what a incredible thing of fate. I've got this deal. I'm meeting with somebody that's really kind of one of my heroes that I've always admired. I've known him as a professional football player, and I get a chance to get to know the guy. And so we meet over breakfast. I find out that, in fact, they are the closest of friends. They meet every week. They mentor each other. They've got a relationship that's as tight as any I've ever heard about professionally and personally. And then... So Johnny and I hear about his Moving Families Initiative, which you'll hear about, and his commitment to, he's a realtor all his, you know, since his profession, I've learned all about Johnny. And then I Google Gino Balfari, Blafari. And so I realized that, wow, I met somebody who has received Riz Media's leadership of the year award, he's got, what, 50, 60,000 agents working for him. He's in charge of Berkshire Hathaway Home Services. He's <clears throat> a little more than just some Italian guy in flip-flops and a <laughs> pair of shorts who's, you know, who I'm going to hook him uh, as I leave the meeting. And isn't that fascinating how that applies to your, to your life? and the relationships you have and the opportunities you have every time you have a chance to help a family. You don't know where it's going to lead you. And I will tell you that what it's led me to is to have an incredible opportunity to have a relationship to allow these two incredible men to share their stories. I've asked Gino to tell a little bit about his story because it's amazing. Both of them have amazing histories and amazing stories that they could just each come and talk for two and a half hours and you would get inspired by and motivated by, but they have a particular message. Um, the great thing about this is they both are committed to Gino, particularly focuses on success, professionalism, and he'll talk about those things, and Johnny's going to introduce him formally. Johnny, though, has a unique message that I want you to pay attention to that I think is critical to why we connected so, so closely. Um, and that is our commitment at ABOR to be a strong force for improving Austin, Texas and improving this community and the Board of Realtors collectively working 
to influence decisions, education, relationships in a way that make Austin what it really claims to be. And how by serving the community through serving the families one at a time, we improve the lives of everybody we serve and those who are benefited and those who are related to those we serve. You'll hear about that today. It is with the greatest honor and humility that I introduce to you now my very good friend, Mr. Johnny Johnson. Testing, testing. I believe I am on. And um, I'm on in more ways than not to have a unique opportunity to stand before you this morning. And Paul, you know, um, um, real estate is an interesting world. As you know, I came from the sports world and I am amazed at how many parallels there are from the sports world to the real estate world because underneath, um, it's about connections, it's about people. So when I think of, when I think of leaders, uh, when I think of communities, sports brings communities together. But the real estate profession is the glue that keeps and holds a community together. And so uh, I stand before you humbly uh, with thanks and gratitude for you providing us the opportunity uh, and for your staff. And um, I'd like to thank each and every one of you. And I'd like to begin by just introducing, I'm going to introduce Gino in just a second, but I'd like to introduce someone who's close and dear uh, to my heart at World Class Coaches, and that's Miss Karen Turnquist. Karen, if you wouldn't mind just standing up for a moment here, please. Some of you may know Karen, but she is a thorn in my side. <laughs> She is the smartest thing that I've ever been around, and she has three master's degrees, um, but she has a master's degree really in commitment to being the very best that she can be. And coming out of the sports world, every day, every day we woke up with one common goal, to be better today than yesterday and better tomorrow than today. And if you were not, better today than yesterday, chances are you were not going to be long for that profession. And so um, I was that way in high school, I was that way in college, uh, and obviously for 10 years in the NFL I was that way. But this lady is this way for the next, I tell her she's going to be working for world class coaches until she's 105 years old. <laughs> and she'll be that way for that long. So that's part of why this is so unique. Um, Paul, the introduction was interesting for two fronts. Um, when I was in the NFL, in my seventh year, I had a vision of the coaching process we use as world-class athletes to be the best that we can be, being available for all sectors of society. From that vision, I shared it with my life coach who suggested that I gain some business experience in some other profession other than football, and I chose real estate sales, not knowing a clue about what it took <laughs> to sell real estate. Gino is going to talk about goal setting, being the best that you're going to be, but I was accustomed to that makeup, so what I decided is I had three years left on my NFL contract. I decided that I was going to follow some basic goal setting rules that I had applied to my entire life. So I said, by the time I retire from the NFL, I like to be producing a minimum of 100 transactions a year. Now, I didn't know that the average realtor at that time only produced six. <laughs> so now, it's a good thing I didn't know that. So I set out to accomplish that and sure enough, uh, by the time I retired, I realized that it, it took a little bit more than, than playing football to, to, to sell real estate. And that's because underneath it, one of the greatest needs in society, you played a quarterback to meet if you're a realtor. 
People are constantly going through periods of transition and change. Sports taught me that. Professional coaches, actually all coaches in sports move on the average 12 to 16 times during their coaching career. So in society, um, that transition provides you with a very unique opportunity. You're going to hear some from Gino later today about the Move in Families initiative. Um, I had a friend who called me one night at 8 o'clock, and he said, Hey, I just signed with the Detroit Lions. Now, remember, we're on the West Coast, Los Angeles Rams. And I said, Wow, when do you have to be there? He said, Tomorrow. I said, Really? I said, well, what about your family? Because he had a wife and two young kids. He said, oh, I don't know. We'll have to figure that out, but I have to be there tomorrow. So, I go, man, that's got to be tough on the family. So, in this instance, he's gone. And there's a chain of needs that that's a family faces every day, particularly those families with young kids. So the Moving Families Initiative has a focus. That focus is serving those families, I'm talking about the parents with kids ages 19 and younger. Our goal really is to help those kids as they change neighborhoods, schools, and friends. But it's that parent that we really have to meet the needs of if we're going to have an opportunity to serve those kids. Annually, more than 10 million of those kids move or relocate throughout the United States. Well, with the Moving Families Initiative, we do have a goal that by October 5th, 2022, we will be serving every single one of the more than 10 million kids who move or relocate in some way. That's our goal. It's a big old gigantic goal, isn't it? It's kind of like the 100 transactions. Well, as it relates to the 100 transactions a year, I sold real estate for nine years, three of those while I was playing pro football. And I remember there was one period where I looked at my closings and it said 121. I said, wow. But that was the end of the first quarter of the year. So, I, and I don't say that to brag or boast. I don't say that to brag or boast. I'm saying that there, there are needs in society. And what I discovered is something I learned from billionaire owners, is if you figure out what that need is, and you improve every day to put yourself in the best position to meet the needs and to achieve the goals, there is no goal that's out of reach for you. And that's particularly the case, in my opinion, if you are a realtor, because there are so many great needs. The Move in Families Initiative has provided me with that, you got, uh, that unique opportunity and all the people that we work with, and thanks to Gino, um, he has provided me with a platform um, to have an opportunity to serve all more than 10 million of those kids. And so as I, as I prepare to bring him aboard, you have a very unique opportunity to do two things. Really identify and understand what the true needs are of families that are moving or relocating, particularly those with kids. And second of all, you take steps daily to put yourself in the best position to be the very best that you can be. And when those two merge together, there is no goal that's going to be out of reach for you. I don't say that to brag or boast, but every one of those goals I've set, I've hit. So on October 5th, 2021, Paul, I'll be calling you up, and I'm, hopefully I'll be telling you I've hit that goal. But I'm going to hit it because of, of support like you. And one of the reasons why I have those opportunities is, as Paul said earlier, uh, coming from the sports world, connections, teammates, coaches, Gino and I go way back, I don't know, probably close to 25 years, it seems like. And every week we meet. We meet over breakfast. One week, he prays and he pays. The next week, I pray and I pay. 
and we brainstorm, but we coach, we mentor. And that friendship, if I miss a week, like recently because of travels, um, we went several weeks and literally I was beside myself. So the one thing that I always told a lot of my teammates when I was playing football was we're going to be friends for life. We are truly friends for life. I'm talking about former players, but I don't see them very often. Gino Bafari is a friend for life that he and I would be meeting and seeing each other, Karen, until we are 105 years old. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to introduce my mentor, my coach, my good friend, Gino Bafari. Thanks, thanks, Johnny. All right. I think am, I am on. Good. You can, you can kind of hear me. Well, first of all, that was very nice of what everyone said. And, and uh, where was that, Paul? What, what? Orlando. Okay. So I was, you know, not only a bedhead, it was like 6 o'clock was 3 a.m. West Coast time where I'm from. Okay. Um, but in any case, it's great to be here. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm kind of amazed at uh, Austin. Just, uh, I've been here maybe two or three times before, but never for this long. It's usually just in and right out. And, you know, I'm from Silicon Valley, and it just kind of, I, I get that feeling here of that momentum of your, uh, you know, of your city. And, um, Paul, you were saying that about how many people come in every day or every 150 people every day. Wow. Yeah, so, so it's a pretty exciting time. So I'm, I'm going to take you through um, uh, seven principles that hopefully – have helped me and hopefully they can help you. So hopefully at the end of the day, you, you, you get a takeaway. Not going to be a, certainly, I think that's the only time you'll see Berkshire Hathaway Home Services up. There's not a Berkshire Hathaway Home Services commercial at all. This is all good, I think, stuff for you to learn and, and, and go away. And perhaps if you, if you apply it, you can increase your per person productivity perhaps by one more transaction per quarter. Now, those, those numbers he was throwing out is like, wowzer. I'm, yeah, those, are, those are big. And, and Johnny, thank you for the introduction. You know, Johnny not only was a, I mean, obviously a pretty good football player, right? Played at Texas, was the best guy there, played 10 years for the Rams. But some of you don't know, I think he was drafted by the Philadelphia Phillies and he, as a catcher. And get this, as a catcher, he ran a 4 3 5 40, which would make him the fastest player in all of Major League Baseball as a catcher, you know? And I think football was probably his third, third or fourth best sport. So, in any case, I rest my case here. Let's 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 get going through here. Um, I will tell. I, I got a little story for you though. As um, you're gonna, I'm going to give you some background here. But one of the things I've done is I've gone around to meet all our of our affiliates and all different people all around the country that I meet, no matter what event it is. If it's NAR and, and Paul's there, the question I get asked all the time is, Have you met Warren Buffett? Right? Because of uh, the Berkshire Hathaway thing. Let me let me. Uh, I think my clicker's not working. It will. Okay. Probably because, you know why? Because it's not on, you know? It's like, we don't care if the horse is blind, just load the wagon, right? Okay. Um, there we go. <laughs> there, it's working. Okay. So, um, Berk Berkshire Hathaway Home Services uh, and Home Services itself is like the, of, of company-owned uh, brokerages, it's the second largest real estate company in the country to Realogy, the, the, the uh, Cobalt Banker, Century Dwell, that whole group there, um, as far as from, from ownership type. But we are so tiny compared to Berkshire Hathaway Energy, which we roll up to, and they're so tiny to Berkshire Hathaway, all right? So I'll give you perspective here. Um, so that was, that was my, my thing. I, I, Warren Buffett bought my company in Taro, Lisa Marie, uh, you know, we're old pals there. Um, but I had not, on three occasions I was supposed to meet Warren, I hadn't met him. So I called up, um, I sit on a board at Home Services with a guy named Greg Abel. And you'll know that name because Greg Abel is the heir apparent to Warren. Warren's 80, will turn 87 this August, right? So Greg Abel and I sit on the board, so we become friends. And I said, hey, Greg, one of the questions I get all the time from all of our affiliates and everywhere I go is, have you met Warren Buffett? And I say, when I say no, they're more disappointed than I am, right? <laughs> I go, can, can you help me out with that? I asked him to do that. And he says, yeah, you're going to get an invitation to the Berkshire Hathaway Energy Leadership Conference. Warren will be there. I'll make sure you get to meet him, and I'll make sure you get to ask the first question. So fast forward, it's January this year, and we're at the Berkshire Hathaway Energy Conference. And I'm sitting, now, for example for you, 
you know how big home services is. There's only six real estate people there. There's 380 Berkshire Hathaway Energy executives there. That's how much they dwarf us. So we get at that back table, right by the door. We're all texting together. Hey, let's sit at the back table because, you know, we're the redheaded stepchild and, you know, we're by the door, etc. And um, I was really impressed when Paul talked because it got real quiet in here, which doesn't normally happen in a real estate, you know, um, meeting. But, uh, man, Berkshire Hathaway meeting five minutes before you can hear a pin drop, right? So Greg gives, uh, so I'm sitting at my back table, and this gal comes up to me, and she's kind of like looking at our name tag. She goes, Gino? Yeah. He goes, oh, um, Greg's got a seat up front. He wants you to sit up front. I'm like, oh, okay. So I come walking up to the front. I'm sitting practically right, right where Paul is, and the stage is right here, right? And there, there's a mic right by, and he goes, and he wants you to ask the first question of Warren when he can ask questions. I'm thinking, oh, man, okay, that's great. So Greg gives his talk. Right? Now we're going to come down. Warren's coming. Big deal. Warren Buffett is coming. The, you know, the man, right? So we're all down, and that's, that's the 380 people, okay? The 2017 executive leadership team for Berkshire Hathaway Energy. It's a madhouse of people down there. Same gal comes up, and she says, Gino, yeah, Greg's got a special place for you to stand. <laughs> really? The real estate guy, right? So you can go up there. Right in the middle, Greg Abel. Over here, Warren Buffett. On the other side was me. So there I am. So there's my claim to fame right there, if you can see that on there, right? You know? Yeah. They said it was business casual, and only a few people, of course, Warren and, and Greg Abel, had ties on. But, uh, so there's my name to claim to fame. And I did get to meet Warren Buffett, which was cool. And I did have to ask him the question, which is kind of a lot of pressure, right? You're in with 386 executives, and you only know six of them, or five of them. And I had to ask the question. So as soon as um, I had that, oh my gosh, I got to ask this question, I kept rehearsing it over and over and over in, in my head so I could Get up to the mic. So Greg gets done interviewing Warren, and now they're going to ask for questions for the audience. And Greg expects me to ask the first one. So he said, any questions from the audience? I stand right up. And he goes, oh, Gino. And I'm like, see, Greg Hamill knows who I am, right? But, <laughs> but no. Um, and then I asked my question to Warren. And, and I looked right in, like, Warren's there, right where Paul is, and I looked right at Warren. It was kind of cool. I says, Warren, I really sounded smart. I said, Warren, what is your vision on how the Berkshire Hathaway operating companies can work with the other Berkshire Hathaway companies when there's business synergies? You know, looking for relocation business, right, guys? You know, and then Warren gave his answer. So that was it, my claim to fame there. Now, moving right along. Okay, moving right along. Uh, let's see what we have. Snowstorm there, and oh, yes, serendipity. How many of you, you kind of believe in some of these things like that? You know, my daughter's into yoga. She teaches yoga. Um, you know, we're meditating, doing things. But, but it's funny. I grew up in Silicon Valley, but is actually born in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, in an area called the Berkshires, where everything you could imagine is called Berkshire. There's Berkshire printing, Berkshire bagels, Berkshire bakery. I mean, everything is Berkshire General Store, Berkshire Bank, Berkshire Paint, Berkshire Sheriff, Berkshire Organics. Even our newspaper in Pittsfield, Massachusetts is called the Berkshire Eagle. So isn't that kind of ironic? Decades later, I'm kind of tied into Berkshire. I thought, well, that kind of, it's kind of interesting. Because I always had that Berkshire in the back of my, the non-conscious portion of my brain, right? So, so that was interesting. And, um, and then another thing happened. I don't know if any of you saw um, Becoming Warren Buffett. It was an HBO special, January 30th on HBO. So I'm there, and um, my mother and Warren happen to be the same age. They're like 12, 12 days apart. And so I'm watching it at my mom and dad's house, becoming Warren Buffett. You know, hey, watch the show. So we're there watching. And as a kid, every spring, our family, we would watch The Wizard of Oz. It was the biggest deal, right? And then you'd be singing whatever song it was. But my mom would always sing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. To this day, Paul, I can't hear that. I hear that it's Hawaiian version of that song, and my eyes well up, right? Because it just takes me back in time. So I'm watching Berkshire, I'm watching Becoming Warren Buffett, they're interviewing Warren's son, and he says, yeah, goes on. we would watch The Wizard of Oz, and my dad would sing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. I'm like, look at my mom, I'm like, you can't be kidding me, right? It was such a powerful thing to the Buffett family that they end the whole show with Warren singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow, you know? 
And what I really thought was that was interesting and also thought that a good thing he's good at picking stocks because he can't <laughs> sing, right? In any case, and on the recording, that has to go or you will never see me here again, right? <laughs> or anywhere else for that matter. Okay, so that's a little serendipity. Okay, um, this past May was kind of an interesting thing. I received a doctorate in leadership from Woodbury University and uh, I was able to give the commencement speech, which was kind of cool. Now, when I graduated from college, that'd be the last thing I ever think that some, they were gonna ask me to give a commencement speech. That'd be like having, I don't know if you're old enough for this joke, but evil Knievel valet park your car, right? <laughs> you know? Um, so I, I gave this commencement speech, and I had to tell like a little bit of a history and then given seven principles of success. And as I, as I thought about those later and later, I said, wow, this is a good message for real estate group. So we're, that's what you're going to get in a, in a, in a moment. Um, I was the kid in the neighborhood that always took care of your yard when you were on vacation, brought in your mail, watered the lawn, did whatever. So at 15 years old, I had my first company. It was called B&M Enterprises, right? And if you look at that, there's not even area codes back then. And my name is actually Gene. You know, and uh, you know, it's kind of evolving. So that was my first step into leadership, doing just kind of like odd jobs around. And I mentioned before, I grew up in a working class Italian family in Sunnyvale, California, Silicon Valley. They bought their house for $18,500. Today, they're still in the same house. It's worth two million bucks, solely because where it is. Solely because where it is. Location, 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 as we talked about earlier. Speaking of that, before I, before I move on, I'm going to go off track here. You know, location, location, location has always been the thing for real estate, right? Think about this, because you want, as realtors, we have a tendency to not be relevant. And I'm, I'm possessed right now. I get possessed on different things. Right now, I'm possessed on being relevant, because I don't believe any brand out there is relevant, right? So I'm possessed on being relevant. Think about this. We're going to have driverless cars. We're going to have driverless cars where you can do whatever you want when you're in the car. You just dial up, the car takes you there. I wonder what's going to happen with location, 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 when an hour and 15 minute commute all of a sudden becomes fun because you can do everything else you can and maybe you can live out further. So just an interesting part. But um, the little family there, my dad was a government employee and everybody else in Sunnyvale worked at Lockheed. And everybody at Lockheed made more than the government employees. So it kind of always, always grew up, kind of felt like we were like a little bit poorer than the poor, right? But it was cool, learned some great lessons from my mom and dad, and I still use those to this day. Somebody, I think it was you that asked me, right? I was talking about, he goes, well, how come you're a Longhorn, you know, such a Longhorn guy, right? It was um, Kennard, right? Yeah. Ken, yeah, Ken said that to me earlier when I ran into him. And, and I said, well, it's because of Johnny Johnson. He goes, so well, where did you go? I go, well, it wasn't, it wasn't Longhorns. I, I went to the only place that would take me, you know? I went to San Jose State University, and again, not having any money like many of us have been there before, right? But here's what I was, I was a great time manager even back then, Lisa, okay? So here's what I did. I did the math on how, how many classes you'd have to take per quarter to get out on time. Found out it was four. So what I did was I took a 7.30, 8.30, 9.30, 10.30 30 class, was out of school by 11.30, jogged to my car that I parked on 10th Street, and then drove to my full-time job at the Cherry Chase Golf and Country Club. I literally ate my lunch in the car, changed in the car, and then work from noon to 8 p.m. That was my college. And it's so interesting when I see my, my I two millennial kids, one 26 and 24, one went to um, Boulder, CU, and the other one went um, to Cal Poly, and this, their college life is so much different. In fact, their after college life is so much different, right? <laughs> you know? Um, but in any case, that, that, was, my, that was my college uh, career. And um, during college, I had the privilege of working at a golf course which is really cool, right? So I knew, and, I, and because I like to do gardening and all of those things, it was like right up my alley. I actually became the youngest golf course superintendent in California. You had to be at least 18. Like, is that the age for real estate here in yes. Texas? Yeah, at least 18, but you had to work for the owner. So you had to be a direct report of the owner. Just so happened that's what it was. So that's what, it, that, that, that's what I did. And um, let's see, this is the next job there. So I went from the golf course to the golf course, and here's what had happened. Because the Silicon Valley land was starting to become so valuable, the owner of the golf course sold it to a developer who was going to build houses around the golf, the valuable golf course land. And they had no one to run the thing. So it was perfect timing for me. And I thought, wow, what a great job. So I'm 22 or 23 years old, 
and now I'm the director of golf. So what am I? Man, I'm the, the pro shop manager. I'm the bar manager. I'm the restaurant manager. I'm the superintendent. I'm even the swim team coach. It was a country club, right? I'm the swim team coach. And that job for a 23-year-old kid came with a house right on the middle of the golf course, four-bedroom house. And over the, the shed, the, the, the barn or whatever the workstations you call it there, was a two-bedroom condo. It, you know, we, didn't know, we didn't have really condos back then. It was a two-bedroom apartment. So I said, wow, I was already in the instru real estate business, Paul, because I could rent three rooms to some friends, rent the condo out. So I was having all these different little things going, and that was a great job. And it was really fun. And I thought, man, I'm on top of the world. What a great, great thing to do. And in my head, I was trying to figure out how one day I could actually, you know, buy the golf course. But now the developer bought it and things were, things were changing. Now we're, 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 in the, we're in the early, early 80s at this time, okay? And um, the land's being worth more and more. And now the developer, oh, wait a minute. One more thing, one more thing. Should have looked at these slides before, right? Again. Competitive. We're, are we all competitive in real estate? Yes, right? This business isn't for the weak-willed or the faint of heart. It's for those of you who get sick to your stomach if you're not in the top 10% of any competitive activity. Man, that dude's competitive, right, Johnny? You know, it was like, wowzer. Those are big numbers there. Um, but so being competitive, I thought, okay, the golf course has been around for 25 years. What's the most number of rounds they ever sold? And the most number of rounds they ever sold is 25,000 rounds. So I had a goal to do 26,000 rounds. And just like some of our goals, when you stay focused on them, you get them. We did it. The first year, we did 26,000 rounds. The next year, we did 42,000 rounds. And the third year, we did an amazing 58,000 rounds. It was kind of amazing. Well, how did that happen? Well, we fixed the golf course up a little bit more. But we just took a few principles that I learned at San Jose State Business School and from a book by one of my professors, Dr. Pete Zidnack, recommended this book that I'd never heard before, right? And all of you have heard of it. It the, was the iconic Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. How many of you have read that book? It's old, yeah, it's been around since Jesus was a baby, right? Um, but it's still got some great, 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 great principles in it, and, and, and that's what happened. So it all came you know, to, it was great, but it all came to an abrupt ending, an abrupt ending, and that's because the developer now, as we're getting down to Nike 83 and interest rates were real high, now it wasn't, the land was worth so much money that, you know, the heck with the golf course that they were going to build that I was going to run for them and have houses around it, they're going to plow it under. So it's like, wow. You know, it's kind of like my, it was like my baby, right? And now uh, it's going away. And I thought, what happened to me? What, what happened? Well, because of my reputation for hard work and results, they still gave me a job. So now I'm working in construction, okay? So I go from the king of the golf course to sweeping out houses and cleaning up job sites. I learned how to build a house and I learned a bunch of things, but it just wasn't rewarding. And it's the first time probably in my career, my career after school, that I was kind of depressed. Like, what happened? You know, I didn't really understand what happened. I hadn't studied, you know, anything on, on how to, you know, be successful or do things. I just, like, what happened here to me? And I was feeling like just down. And then we've all had a, uh, you know, we've probably had three or four defining moments in your career that something changes. Well, here's what happened. I'm on the job site, okay? And um, a car pulls up, a cool BMW. And this really cool guy gets out. I mean, look like, here, right here, stand up. Okay, see this dude right here? There's a cool looking guy, right? <laughs> Give him a round of applause. Okay, well that's what happened. That's what happened, okay? Look at the old BMW, and there's the cool looking dude, right? And that, that guy gets out, you know, and he goes into the model home. So I ask around, who is that guy? What does he do? What is that? And I find out that he sells the model home. So it was one of those, if a picture's worth a thousand words, the picture he portrayed, one of fun and success, caused me immediately right there that day, I'm, going to, I'm getting a real estate license and getting out of this. So that's what I did. So I got a real estate license. First company is Fox and Carscadden. If you're from Silicon Valley, and you've been around a long time, you might remember, that was like the elite high-end company. They didn't take new agents. They were just very, very high-end company. And I had to go there like three times to try to convince them to hire me. And finally they did. You know, if you're kind of like persistence. I was, I was studying every, every trainer that was out there. Tommy Hopkins was really big at that time. So I studied you know, six no's before I get a yes. So I can, we told you no, huh? I asked him again, you know. So finally they, they hire me, and then they regret it. Big time, 
because I'm like Johnny coming out of the chute with 120 houses in, in a quick, can you even do that, you know, in, in, in that short of time, okay, I can't sell one. And I'm working harder than anyone, harder than anyone. I've turned my TV off for a year. I'm committed. I just can't get a deal. I've listened to every Tommy Hopkins tape, every Mike Ferry tape, every Floyd Wickman tape, every Zig Ziglar tape. I, I could talk like Zig today because I listen to so many, so many stuff. But I can't, but I can't sell a house, and I'm so depressed, so depressed. But I'm pretending I'm not, you know, and I'm always showing up and you know, putting on that smiling face. And um, one of my friends, you know, Tommy Hopkins, they got to like you and trust you, right? So one of my friends, Don, Debbie Stats, they call me up. I've known them since kindergarten. They want to maybe sell their house and buy a bigger house in Sunnyvale. Now we're 1985. Great. So I go, go I get to their house at 7 o'clock on Thursday night, and I've got, I'm Mr. Sale. I knock on the door, Don answered, Don, it's 7 o'clock, and... We have an appointment at 7 o'clock, you know, and I'm there on time, right, doing everything. And, and they, I find out that they want four bedrooms. They want two bathrooms. They want a separate family room. They want Homestead High School, which was our nicest high school. And they want this all for 200000 And interest rates were still at about 14% then. So 200000 you don't get, you can't go to 215 you can't stretch it, you know. It was exactly there what they were qualified for. And again, even though, just like a typical new person when you're new, I spent two and a half hours on the initial listing appointment, right? And uh, I mean, I did it all. I parked across the street. I made some notes on the thing. I walked through. I looked around the house. You know, I did all the things that any trainer would tell you to do. Two and a half hours, I'm driving back. I'm thinking, what a pipe dream. I just wasted two and a half hours. I got to get a job. Oh, one dollar bill. One dollar bill in my pocket. One, I don't even have a one anymore. One dollar bill in my pocket for six months. That's how broke I am. That's how broke and depressed I am. But in any case, so, so, so that happens, and um, I'm depressed. That's Thursday. And then defining moment number two. Being from Austin, you might not know this name, but if you studied real estate, like Paul will know this name, um, that's Alain Pinel. Okay? Alain Pinel, the man, a great French guy, he's the ultimate high-end dude. He created this company called Alain Pinel, and, uh, and, but back then in 1985, he was a manager at Fox and Carskadden. Not the lowly Sunnyvale office that I worked at, but the Saratoga office. And we were having a joint meeting with the Saratoga office. It's an interesting story here. Johnny, I don't think I've even shared this story with you. So Alain Pinel talks like this, he's so high end, and he's talking about that. And we're all, he, it's, an, it's a meeting with the Sunnyvale office, mom and pop, the Los Altos office, very high end, okay, very high end. And the Saratoga office, pretty high end, right? And Alan's leading it, and he's, he's the man. And he's talking. Now, Alan, and, and I've, sometimes I have the same problem too. Hopefully, I'll keep your attention for while I'm here. But Alan can talk. He talks like the fucks and cars get in his greatest risk. He talks and talks and talks. It's really good, but after a while, you know, they say you can only hold an audience attention for 20 minutes, right? And I'm going to try to do it for like about an hour or so now. But in any case, he's talking, talking, talking. And pretty soon, just like anything else, I start looking around, right? And it was, you know, those, you know when the old textured ceilings, you know, and I'm looking up there, and I look like a dinosaur. You know, that's a really good. I'm just looking at these things, right? And, and um, I'm just looking around, and I see, um, I see a flyer. As I'm looking around, I see a flyer on the wall. And I kind of look over it, you know. Alon's just still talking. He hasn't, hasn't even taken a breath, right? And I, I see the flyer, and it said four bedrooms, three bathrooms, separate family room, separate dining room, Homestead High School, one ninety nine nine fifty. And I'm like, so I walk up there, grab it off the wall. I proceed to walk around to everyone's desk because they, they didn't care about paper back then, right? And I take every single flyer that's in there, okay? I get to the back of the room. I get eye contact with Alon Pinnell. And he's like, why did we hire that guy, right? And I leave, okay? It's Monday. I leave. Monday morning meeting. I leave. Now, and I, I get into my, not my real estate car, my golf course car, an Alfa Romeo Spider, okay? You know, tiny, you need a shoehorn to get in it, right? So I go to their house. And again, fate's a funny thing. I go up to the door. He's a deputy sheriff. She's a nurse. They happen to be home. Knock on the door. 
Don answers the door. Don, my head's bobbing just like they tell me. You're looking for a home with four bedrooms, aren't you? Yes. And if it had, you wanted two bathrooms. If it had three, that would be better, wouldn't it? You know, wouldn't it, shouldn't it, couldn't it? You know, all the little tie downs, you know. I'm like, oh, no. You know, he's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so then I got to, then Debbie's starting to listen. They want to have a family. So then I'm like, okay, let's see. Tommy Hopkins said, said I had to summarize the sale. So Don, tell me, if it had four bedrooms, three bathrooms, a separate family room, separate dining room, Homestead High School, and you could get it to, and you could get it for two hundred thousand, you'd buy it today, wouldn't you? He goes, Yeah, we would, Gino. I'm like, Man, this this shit works, you know. So, so I said, Hey, follow me. I can't say get in my car. I say, follow me. <laughs> now, clearly on the flyer, it's Monday. It says no show till tour on Friday. But I ain't stopping me because I ain't going to be in business on Friday, right? <laughs> so I have them wait at the curb. I have them wait at the curb. And I knock on the door. And Mr. Taroka, Japanese man, still remembered as today. Paintbrush in his hand. Mr. Taroka, Gino Blafari here at Fox and Carskadden. Your house is perfect for my customers. Oh, no. No, sh no, no, no show till Friday. We're painting it. Okay, that's one no. So, Mr. Taroka, you know, I, honest to God, I ask him six times. Okay? I get to the, I, I'm asked, I've asked him six times. He said no six times in a row, but I just won't give up, right? And so I look out at the stats, and they're looking at me like, is everything okay? You know, your customers will look at you like, is that okay? And, and I turn back around, and I say, look, he's a deputy sheriff. She's a nurse. It's the only time they can see it. Can't we come in? And he's like, he gave up, right? So I'm like, like so, so six no's, and I got it. Again, this shit works, you know? <laughs> so now, now, we're, now we're going in. Now we're going in, we're looking at this house like this because the walls are all painted, right? And we can't touch the walls, and they, it's perfect, they want it. So I'm driving back to their house, and here's what's going through my little feeble San Jose State brain. 200,000 times 3% is 6,000, I'm gonna 50-50 split, $3,000, gonna make that $3,000, and I'm getting out of the real estate business that's not for me. <laughs> Honest to God, exactly what I said. Okay, so now I try to write the offer, which I don't know how to do because I've never written one before and we don't have a computer program that prompts you here, click here, click there, you know. I'm trying to write the thing and now I'm gonna take this offer that Monday afternoon back to the Saratoga office where these Saratoga agents that slightly mispriced the home because they looked at the comps and they didn't notice that it was moving already, right? So I get there. Now they're like my mom, right? And so I'm like, Billy Kinder, June after, I go, you know, so I, I go, hey, I got an offer for you on the property. Well, how'd you get in, Gino? And because I was just so naive and probably just, you know when you're so dumb, you know, you say, hey, that guy's nice. Well, he had to be nice or someone would have killed him by now, right? <laughs> um, you, know, you're, you're, you know, they, they oh, okay, well, well, we'll help you. And they, you know, put my offer together, you know, initial here for Don, you know, oh, Debbie missed that initial, you know, we get it all squared away, right? Yeah. You know, somebody got, a few of you got that one. Um, but that's how we did business in the old days, right? It's a handshake deal. They wanted to buy it, we were buying it. Uh, minor detail if we missed an initial. Um, so, so they say, they take, the, they, they take the, the offer and they give me 30 days to sell that little house in Sunnyvale, all right? So now I go back there to Don and Debbie. Remember, I'm Mr. Train Guy. I got my listing agreement already filled out when I get in there, and I give it to them. I'm going to list their house for 165000 and I'm just, he's initialing this, initialing, and then he comes down to the commission. I got filled in 6%, right? And he gets to the commission, and he's a big, bold, you know, it's negotiable. You know, he goes, he goes, you got 6% filled in there, Gino. He goes, isn't it negotiable? And, of course, I have this, the lamest real estate line again. <laughs> yeah, it is, but I can only go up, you know? <laughs> That's what one of the trainers told me, right? So, and, and, and he goes, he goes, okay, you know, and initials it, and we keep going our merry way, all right? You just got to try this stuff, right, you know? Okay, so, so now, and every single thing I tell you is, is so 
exactly the way it was. Okay, so now um, I'm going to hold an open house. Now I've held an open house for six months as a guy with a one dollar bill in my pocket. Right? Now, and and I probably portrayed that one dollar poor me guy. Right, my physiology was probably like this. Now I'm like. Good. I just sold a house. I'm going to sell this house, and then I'm getting out of the real estate business. That's not for me. Okay? You know? And what happened? Silicon Valley, 1985, May. Guy walks in from Asia. Asians are just coming into Silicon Valley. It's half Asian. There's about half. It's very diversified now, but back then it wasn't. Suitcase, 162,000. It was like right here. He was like. He was like, I got some special wonton soup for you, you know, right? You know, and, 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 and he, you're going to have to edit this tape. Um, and, and, and he um, buys the house off me. So I'm like, wow, that's like three deals now because I got both sides of that, right? And I would say 165 times 6%. You know, I'm doing the math on it, right? Wow, now I made like, you know, 7,500 bucks. It's pretty good but I'm not, still not sure about real estate, right? One of the things I did at the company at Fox and Carscadden that I became very good friends with everybody, back then, in the old, old, old days, like I said, when Jesus was a baby, when someone would call the office, it wouldn't be some remote thing, press this for this person, press that for that. It'd be an actual live, oh, Fox and Carscadden, but I'm not sure where that person was, right? and they would try to take some messages. So I would take it off the answering, and I'd sit up at the reception desk, and I'd take all these calls. And because I practiced how to do floor, you know, we've had an awful lot of activity on that property. Can you hold for a moment? And then, by the way, thanks for holding. My name's Gino. Can I have yours? And they'd give me theirs, and I'd get all their information. Okay, just before I did. And so I'd be calling up all the different realtors in the office. Hey, Gloria, someone called on your listing. Here's their name and number. Call them back. Then Gloria would sell it. And all of a sudden, I become Gloria's best friend, right? That happened to maybe several people, but once in a while, someone would call him without a realtor. It happened that night again, called him in, took him through my little analysis of home ownership that I did for all buyers that had still never worked for me yet. And, 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 he, and he saw it, and uh, he already had a realtor. I just told him I'm going to practice on him, set him, set, him, uh, set him on his way. Two days later, he calls me back and says, you know, we have a realtor, but we like you more. We want to sell with you. And I go, well, by the way, the house you called on, there's another one that's up there. I met them out there at that house, and they freaking bought the thing. So I got four deals. That weekend, I sold two more houses. So now I have six deals. It's Monday, and we're about to the third defining moment in my career. Now, one of the things I always did was that I always wanted to learn. So I sat behind, like, the smartest realtor that I knew, a guy by the name of Mike Ray. And he was just brilliant. We didn't have as his addendums back then, you, where you, you would actually have to write what you said. And so I'd have to ask Mike, and Mike, like a real smart guy, he's kind of like cuckoo too smart, right? And he'd be sitting in front of me, and I, hey, Mike, Mike, uh, I want to do um, an as is. How do I do it, as is? And he'd turn around like this with kind of like a, a, a smart guy look on his face, one that I've never showed you. But in any case, um, and he'd go, in consideration of the purchase price accepted by the buyer, buyer accepts his property in its present structural condition with all faults. Buyer is ready to approve the termite report, property inspection report, the roof. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, but I'd memorize all that. So then the next time I was in front of a customer and they wanted to do it, we would like to sell it as is, Gina. What would we do? I said, well, we'll put a little clause in there that says, in consideration of the purchase price accepted by the seller, buyer accepts our property in its present structural condition. So in other words, I became an expert, right? But this guy, Mike Ray, was not my manager trying to jack me up so I'd sell more houses so he'd look good. He's just a good, genuine, great human being, okay? And he was just puzzled by me because he never saw someone try so hard. Probably and never do a deal in six months, right? But um, one morning, I started at 6.30. That was the time I always started every day unless I started earlier. So 6.30 a.m., I'd be in the office. He came in at 7.00. And he comes in one morning, and I got my six deals. And I got these little deals on my tiny little cubicle of a table, and I'm numbering them. And, and he comes in, and he looks at me like this. And it's like, there's nobody else here. So he, I said, Mike, what's wrong? What's wrong? He said, Gino, what are you doing? And I said, Mike, I'm numbering my deals. I got six deals, and I have no idea what I'm doing. No idea at all. <laughs> and he said... You don't want to ever number your deals. 
Really? Well, what do you mean, Mike? He goes, Gino, I've been watching you. You're just kind of crazy. I never saw anyone try as hard as you. I don't saw anyone listen to so many Tommy Hopkins and Mike Ferry and Floyd Wickman. He used to call me Zig. He called me Zig, you know? Um, and, uh, and I called him P.C. Merrill, and I don't even think he knew P.C. Merrill was Zig Ziglar's mentor, right? But, um, <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? I, but I called him that. And, um, and he goes, you don't ever want to number your deals because you don't want anyone to ever know that you've only got six deals going at one time. And I was like, really? Well, well how, many, how many deals should I have? And he said, Gino, you should have 15. And I thought about that a zillion times. Had he been the manager trying to jack, you know, had he had some sort of other influence except to help me, if that would have had the impact on it that it did. But it, it didn't. It, to this day, I still think about that there. And you know what happened? It was like magic. I had 15 deals in about 30 days. I ended up selling, not nowhere near what Johnny would do in a quarter, but I sold 52 houses um, that year. And at Fox and Carscadden in Silicon Valley, that was more than anyone else, which was pretty cool. All right, and I continued that year after year after year. Um, I got way off track here with Alain Pinnell when I saw his face. Okay, then, so here's what happened next. Here's what happened next. So now once, once you're, 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 you know, feeling good, looking good, ought to be in Hollywood, or that's what you're starting to think, right? Because you did a few deals. Everybody's recruiting you. Everybody's recruiting me. My Little League baseball coach calls me up and recruits me to his little company, Contempo. It was a little company at the time. And so I go to work for him, right? And um, so there's, there's, there I am in 19, look at, I have the same picture on my business card that some of you have today on yours, right? <laughs> That's like 1988 picture. So, um, so there I'm there at Contempo Realty, and because my Little League baseball coach and it's a small company, now, I mean, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the top producer in the company, I'm the manager of the Cupertino office, and I'm a partner. Okay, this is great. Grow Contempo from 65 agents or 85 agents, 65 agents to 650 agents. And in 1997, we sell it to Realogy. Four partners wanted to sell, two of us didn't. We're sold. Realogy makes us Century 21. So now I'm the, the president of my old company, Century 21. Perspective for you. Anybody here from Century 21? One. Or you've been at Century 21 at one time? Yeah. Okay. Any case. Yeah, everybody has been at one time, no. But in any case, um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so Century 21, perspective for you, there's 6,500 offices. I not only have the number one company, because Contempo was big, but I have seven of the top 11 out of 6,500. So we're the big team on there. But Realogy is a wonderful company, but they're all about synergies, right? Synergies. So we think, you know what? We got Century 21, we own it. We got Coldwell Banker, Northern California, we own it. If we merge those two together, we create these great synergies. So we merged in with Coldwell Banker, and then I became a senior vice president for NRT. NRT actually runs all those companies that they own. NRT is the largest real estate company in the world right now. All right, so that's what I do. And I, keyword right now. Okay, um, so then I, um, uh, you know, when I sold Contempo, I had a five-year non-compete, and I think every single one of you in this room will appreciate this one. Just four months after my non-compete was up, the entrepreneurial juices started to flow, and I started my own company. And so in to the end of 2002, really 2003, I founded this company called, you may have heard of it, it's in Silicon Valley, called Intero Real Estate Services. At then, it wasn't a Berkshire Hathaway affiliate, it was just Intero Real Estate Services. So I started Intero Real Estate Services, and because of being in the area for like 20 years selling houses, I actually ended up teaching principles of real estate at the community college, so almost everybody that got a real estate license was exposed to me. I had a big network of, of agents, and Intero became the fastest growing real estate company in the history of real estate in 2003. We went from zero to 1.64 billion in sales. Now, I'll give you a little perspective there. 80,000 real estate companies, 83 of them did a billion, we did 1.64 billion our first year. Got, whoa, that's pretty cool and we were doing good, right? You know, you just 
when, when, sometimes it's good but they, if you don't know what you don't know, right? So we're cruising along. Now, the next year, well, here's what I did again, being like the rest of you in this room, I called up NAR and I said, hey, has there ever been a real estate company that was the fastest growing real estate company organically two years in a row? Because, you know, happiness is a low base, right? You got nothing, it's pretty easy to get somewhere. And they said, no. I said, okay, that was our goal. So guess what happened in 2004? This is not, this is, that's Realtor Magazine telling us, it's not Gino saying it, it's not our PR stuff. Here's Realtor Magazine again, Realtor Magazine, and again, the fastest growing real estate company in the country the next year, 2004, was in Terrell, twice as fast as anybody else. We did five and a half billion in sales. That's a lot, okay? That's a lot. So that was cruising back, cruising back then, and, and, and that's cool. Let's see what else I got there. Oh, by 2013, according to Real Trends, Steve Murray at Real Trends, Intero is the seventh largest real estate company in the country. So that all sounds really, 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 really good. Here's what I left out. There's always those ups and those downs, right? Remember 2007? Remember 2008? Okay, 2007, 2008, the market tanked. 80,000 real estate companies shrunk down to 45,000. I almost went broke. Okay, because I reacted too slow to what was going on. I was on CNBC, right? Oh, so it's going to be a smooth landing, you know, and, uh, you know, like it was like Cudlow and Kramer. We could have been, they should have titled it Dumb and Dumber. You know, I still got the tape, right? But, um, you know, a smooth landing there. So b bottom line there, it's 2008, December, and now I'm completely broke. Everything I worked on for 25 years, and I was good at saving money and buying houses and buying this stuff, it's all encumbered, and I'm broke, okay? So I call my mom and dad into the office. They have that house in Sunnyvale, owned free and clear. I have a mortgage company. I refinance their house in Sunnyvale that they own free and clear, take $400,000 out of there, and put it in to make payroll in January. That's, I mean, it was like, here comes a runner, here comes a throw, it's close. But I had already right-sized Intero. I had cut $8 million out of an annual budget. That's exactly what we lost. I had put in a system, which I call the West Coast Offense for running a real estate company, um, 4DX, focus on your wildly important goal, act on your lead measure, have a compelling scoreboard, and create a cadence of accountability. I, I was like freaking Bill Walsh. I could wave my magic wand over any quarterback, and all of a sudden that quarterback was better than he ever was before. Well, I do that with a manager. Same thing. Here's the system. It's this system if you follow it. So, um, it was, it, so that's how Intero became the seventh largest real estate company. Here's how, here's how bad it was. I even joined one of those multi-level marketing companies. Okay, which was terrible, but it was actually the savior because they gave me Success Magazine, and in Success Magazine, there was a CD and a DVD, and one of the CDs was they were uh, um, interviewing um, the guy from Chicken Soup for the Soul, you know, and um, Darren Hardy was interviewing him, and he talked about how they couldn't get anybody to publish the book, and I just turned that around, that whole little story around in, into recruiting, and kind of like, um, I'll give you a perfect perspective. When I took this job, I'm the CEO of HSF Affiliates, and we offer Berkshire, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, Real Living, and Prudential. When we became part of Real Living, I looked at Pacific Union, big company, still a great company in, in, in the area, Northern California, and I looked what they do in 2008, excuse me, 2009, and I looked and they lost 10 million bucks. 10 million bucks is what they lost. My Intero, with the 4DX, we made 3 million. And with my system, you double every year. So by 2013, we're doing good, all right? And so I get a call out of the blue, out of the blue. I'm driving in my car to my Los Gatos office, Brian Crane, you might remember that name, Brian Crane, driving in my Los Gatos office to Brian Crane to pay him his bonus check in 2013 because everything's great. And I get this call out of the blue in the car. Oh, do you know? Yeah, it's Ron Peltier, chairman of home services, he goes, here's what he said, it was funny, he goes, Warren loves real estate. And I'm like, Warren who? You know? And, and I realized who I was talking to, and then, oh yeah, yeah, Warren Buffett, right, okay. And he says, uh, we bought a network. We bought the network from Brookfield, which had the Prudential Network, and we're looking for a CEO. Don't answer me today, I'm calling you back in a week. Let me know if you, what you wanna do. I'm like, oh, that's weird, look at Detra. I'm like, hmm, that's strange. Week goes by, call him back. He calls me back and says, oh, Ron, hey, thanks very much, but it'd be kind of weird 
Here I own Intero Real Estate Services, and I'm the CEO of Berkshire Hathaway. Home service, that doesn't make sense. And he said, well, Gino, if you accept this position, we'll make that transition possible for you and buy Intero. And I thought, hmm, now, had I, had I come so close, not come so close to going broke in 2007 and 8, I would have just kept Intero, right? But because of that, and having the seventh largest real estate company in the country, where I could basically sell it and never have to work again, right? I was like, hmm, let me think about that a little bit, right? And then by, the bottom line was this. It took almost, um, let's see, that was in September of 2013. By May 17th, 2014, I sold my company to Warren Buffett. And that's how I got here today. So here's the interesting piece. You might say, you know, if you just saw it on the surface, if you didn't hear that story, you might say, hey, you went from the golf course to the corner office, right? Bottom line is I just worked my butt off, right? Just like all of you. And that's kind of how you do it. But there's seven principles that have helped me. There's many more. Seven principles that have helped me. I'm going to give you seven that I kind of like. So here we go with actually some... I know you learned a little bit on that story, but you're going to learn a little bit right now. So um, principle number one is to play full out, okay? Paul and I were talking about this earlier. We spend so much time at work, right? And if you, if you want to have a fulfilling life, you've got to want to have fulfilling work, right? So you just want to play full out. Put your whole self in, into the job. Just, you know, look, you're going to be in real estate, be in real estate. You're not going to be in real estate, don't be, but it's kind of like a core covenant. You're either in or out, right? You know, here's, here's the deal. You've heard this one before. If you want to be successful, if you're interested in success, you do what's convenient. Yeah, it's convenient, right? If you're committed to your success, you do whatever it takes. And really what I've discovered, it takes whatever it takes. So play full out. Play full out. Now, there's one of my mentors, Coach Bill Walsh. They called him the genius. And he always said, all competitors find a way to win, right? And that's what we have to do. you got to find that way to get that listing. Find that way to get your buyer's offer accepted. Because, you know, our business is like if you come in second, you make zero, right? You know? So Bill Walsh did that. And then um, my other wonderful friend, Dwight Clark. You know, there's, the, Dwight, Dwight told me this. He says, when the 49ers lost that Super Bowl a few years back, I said, boy, we had first and goal, and we had four tries, and we couldn't get in. I go, because nobody could get open, Dwight. And he goes, look it. When it's a Super Bowl, you get open. You find a way to get open. Okay? There's Everson Walls, a Dallas guy, right, who's like six foot three tall. Dwight is actually 11 feet in the air. A white dude jumping 11 feet in the air to catch that ball, right? You know, that's pretty good, right? You find a way to win. Um, Johnny Johnson, our own Johnny Johnson, says, sports taught me that there's only one way to play the game, on or off the field. If you truly put yourself in a position to achieve your goals, play full out, right? Johnny, our own Johnny Johnson says that. Um, Johnny talks about sports a lot and, and real estate, sports and business, and, that's, and, and I, I do too. And the reason why, it's a meritocracy. That's what our business is, a meritocracy. Sports is a meritocracy. No politics to speak of. It's either you do a deal and get paid or you don't do a deal and get paid, right? Just like sports. You either perform or you don't perform. That's our business there. So if everyone wants to, you know, the old... How do you, your raise gets effective as soon as you do in, in this, right? That's how it is. It's a meritocracy. Um, you got to like it, though. Confucius said, choose a job you like and you never have to work a day in your life. Our own Warren Buffett said we should find work that we love. Steve Jobs. I mean, you can have two different people than Warren and Steve. We should all find a career for which we love. Number two, this is a big one. This is probably, if there was one thing that helped me more than anything else, and Lisa, you kind of know this from past stories, but this is have a good morning routine. Have a good morning routine. Now, I added a bunch of slides in here just yesterday trying to fill the allotted amount of time. So let me just see what I have next slide. Okay, there it is. Okay, good morning routine. Now think about this. When you wake up in the morning, you want to try to change that state to being incredibly confident. Because as a salesperson, you're going to perform how you see yourself, right? Sometimes, especially if you're slightly new, you're like, oh my God, like me. Uh, is real estate for me or what am I going to do? So look at everybody loves the kitty, okay? Everybody loves that kitty. 
But you know what? Most of the sellers won't list with the kitty. They'll list with the tiger, right? So you've got to transform yourself from being that timid little person and have some sort of routine. I'm going to share some things with you on that that can be a real game changer if you applied it because thousands of people have. Um, oh, I guess I'm not going to do that. I'm going to talk to you about your brain, okay? <laughs> I'm gonna, it, it, which, which is a good lead-in to what I'm going to share with you because when you understand how your brain works, and I'll go real quick through this, it's just brain 101 for realtors, and you can see what your brain does. You know, 20% of your energy, 20% of the air you breathe, 25% of your blood flow, 30% of your water, 40% of your nutrients. So your brain's this special thing, nothing like the human brain, all right? Um, back in the 80s and 90s, they had something called MRIs, and now they've got more sophisticated ways to look at your brain. Now here's what that 98% um, number up there means. 98% of what we learned about the brain, we pretty much learned in the last 10 years. And 80% of what we thought we knew about the brain turned out to be wrong when you actually studied it with an MRI where you stimulate, you can watch the electrical activity in your brain. Um, your brain is this, you have 100 billion brain cells. Now they thought you had about 30 billion. Remember they tell you don't drink because you kill your brain cells? Drink up. They thought you only had 30. You got 100. You got 100, you know? I had Texas barbecue last night and I had these Cadillac margaritas. And I had a crazy sleeping night, too. But um, that's an interesting piece there on that. Um, and you, you actually make more brain cells. Um, they've got, your brain can make 10, qu 10, 10 quadrillion. Uh, that's a bunch. That's 10 to the 10th. I didn't even know what it was. It can do that in like a second. It's just bizarre. And then it has, in every brain cell, there's these little connectors. And there's 100,000 miles of connectors. I mean, it's got to be so small, going back and forth and back and forth. It's like every phone line in the, in the world in one little neuron in your brain. So your brain is pretty amazing. Now, this guy here, he won the uh, Eric Crandall. He won the Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize, or he shared it in the year 2000, because he said, he said this, every time you learn something new, you actually rewire your brain. Okay? That's why it's so important at any age to be continuously learning. Okay? Hugely important. Hugely important. Um, three parts of your brain. Your conscious brain. That's what we all perform in right now. That's what we're pretty much in that mode, your conscious brain. Right? It's like the CEO. It's where you, you set your plan, your goals, and things like that. It's got a memory span, actually, of about 20 seconds. I'll give you a perfect example. You're at a brand new meeting, which, which I am now. And I meet um, Michael here. Hey, Michael, how are you? Gino. And then, then I meet Robin. He says, this is Robin. I meet Stacy. Okay. So I, I, I met some people. I met at a cocktail party, right? And then I turn around. And I freaking remember who that guy was, right? It was Michael. That's, the, that's your conscious brain. Okay, um, at work, and we spend about 94 to 96 percent of the time in your conscious brain. Your, uh, they used to say you spend about 10 to 15 percent, or uh, 85 percent. Your non-conscious brain is the power center. And that's what I'm going to hopefully, th maybe th this time or some other time, you can you can learn how to tap into that. But but that's where all the goals are all carried out in the non-conscious portion of your brain. It controls 96 to 98 percent of your perceptions and behavior, and most of us don't use it. All right. um, here's the interesting thing about the non-conscious brain. It's what they call servile, which means it sets no goals of its own. It doesn't judge the merit or the value of the goal. It only tries to carry out the order that you give it. All right. That's an important piece. And uh, I always like to show this. If you want to watch a movie about accessing the non-conscious mind. This is um, Limitless with Bradley Cooper. If you see that movie, if you have, haven't, watch it again. Because all he does is access his non-conscious portion of his brain, and all of a sudden, everything changes in his life. And it's not a movie about the brain. It was just kind of a cool theme, but you know, it was interesting what he was doing. And they probably used a lot of these concepts. So here's a summary. Your conscious mind is what you use to define, articulate, and set the goals, but it's the non-conscious mind that follows through with all the dozens and hundreds of, or millions of actions necessary to achieve the goal. So that's, that's an important piece there. All right, now let's go to the third piece and then we're almost done talking about the brain. And you, some of you heard about the reticular activating system part of your brain, yeah. Like Brian Buffini, different people will talk about that. That's the RAS, it sits at the base of your neck, it connects your spinal cord and your cerebellum and it's actually a big filter. 
for everything that you see goes into this filter. In fact, the next slide shows it right there. If you see it, you taste it, you touch it, you smell it, you, you, you know, any of those senses there, it goes into this big net. If it's relevant to you, you're going to see it. If it's not relevant, you won't see it. It's still there. You just don't see it. Get that? Okay. So next piece there. It's like Google. Okay, your RAS is just like Google. You type a search string into Google, it goes out and it finds something just like what you were looking for, right? Something related to it. Your brain works exactly the same way, only about 800 times faster than Google. Google would be like a stone tablet compared to your quickly how your RAS works. Okay, so there I'm in my office. That's old Intero office. I have, Dietra sits at my desk, I have a stand-up station. My parents are old. They have big old Cadillac. That's typical Italian car, big old Cadillac, right? Probably shouldn't even have a license, but they do. They haven't taken it away yet. They took my dad's away now, but this story is before then. But they would always, he'd be hitting the side of the garage or like the, at the grocery store, those little, you know, hitting that, you know, just not good. So I thought, there's got to be an easier, I read an article that it, like if his car was smaller, it's easier to maneuver. So I call up my car broker, Robert Hammer, and I tell him the story. And he says, Get him a Toyota Corolla. Okay. I got no idea what a Toyota Corolla is. As far as I'm concerned, I never saw a Toyota Corolla. After you have Dietra Google a Toyota Corolla, and there's the, I see that on my screen. And I'm looking at that, and I'm believing in my mind, my conscious mind, I've never seen one before. Okay? Intero's on the Apple campus, right there in Silicon Valley. So I go up the ends. I got a, a, a meeting in San Jose. I go up the end, go up the end. Just as Apple's getting out, it's crowded as can be. You're, you have no traffic, and you think you have traffic, right? Okay? Uh, so it's just all perspective. But I'm getting on that freeway. I'm in the computer. I'm in the, um, the commuter lane because I have an electric car, so you get to go in the commuter lane. But I, I, look in, I look in front of me, and it says Toyota Corolla. Wow, that's weird, right? And then I look over there, and it's a freaking Toyota Corolla. <laughs> and so now I'm kind of like spooked out, you know? Remember, my daughter teaches yoga, so I'm, you know. And um, so I, I look in the rear view mirror, and there's a Toyota Corolla. Now, luckily, no cars on that side of me because I'm in the far side. So now I merge on. As I'm merging on to Highway 280, zipping by me, another Toyota Corolla. Bottom line was, they're always there. I just was not relevant. That's how your RAS works. That's my best example of that, right? So that's why you have to be conscious of what you think about, even when it comes to making money or selling more houses. Let's for, say, for example, you earn 50 or 100, I'm not sure, marketplace. What, what's your average sales price? You're pretty high average sales price around here, right? Yeah, 330. Okay. Oh, man. Man, that's almost, that's Silicon Valley, 1989. You guys are really moving up. Okay. Wowzer. Well, you're high priced. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll take four of them. Um, any case. Um, so you, let's pretend you make $100,000 a year. Well, typically, if you do it year after year after year, it's what you've programmed in your mind that you're worth, just like the Toyota Corolla thing. So even if an idea that would make you $200,000 a year or a million, you don't see it because you haven't programmed that in your head. It's nothing to sneeze at. You just don't see it, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. All righty. So, um, and then somebody asked, where, where is it? Okay, and I always have this is to remind me because I don't, the, there's a medical term for this. It's called stetoma. It's a blind spot in the back of your head. You know how sometimes you're trying to think of something, trying to think of something, and somehow you think of something else and it comes in there. That's, that's, that's where it is. Bless you. Okay, so, so that's what we have. So that was a little brain 101. Now, um, meds. That's our, that's a, when I, let's go back to the first slide was create a great morning routine. Well, every morning I have to take my meds. I take meds, everyday meds. M stands for meditation and prayer. E stands for exercise. D stands for diet. And S stands for sleep. I call those keystone habits that create small wins. Because all I'm looking for is small wins. And small wins are exactly what they sound like and, how, and part of how keystone habits can make widespread changes. There's a huge body of research if you want to Google it on small wins. But essentially it's this. Once a small win is achieved, 
it sets another small win in motion that sets another small win in motion that sets another small win in motion that makes you believe that bigger wins are available. So that's the whole thing of changing my state. Those are the, the four keystone habits. And then the funny thing with meditation, right? You know, and, and of course, remember, I got a little bit more because my daughter teaches this stuff. But meditation, you know, it makes you happy, Dad. Okay, if you say so, you know. Um, but if you study meditation um, and you study monks that meditate, you actually find out that they grow their left prefrontal cortex. And if you look up the left prefrontal cortex, it's part of the brain where you process happiness. So, okay, sounds good to me. So meditation and prayer. I actually, I know this is kind of like the Bible Belt right here in Texas, right? I don't know if any, if I tell you I'm Catholic, I'm, it, you know, I'm, I can't go to heaven or something. But um, I happen to be Catholic, and so part of my meditation is I say the Rosary every single day. I haven't missed since 1983. And so as soon as Dwight got diagnosed with ALS, I said it twice a day for now about a year. But it's just part of that routine. I never, never, because it's the first thing that happens with the, with the M. Um, next one is um, st getting, changing that state. Remember, you're the little puppy, you're the little um, kitten, and you want to change your state to be the tiger. So I have certain things I do. You can pick whatever you want. That guy up there happens to be a guy by the name of Og Mandino. Anybody, anybody heard of Og Mandino? Great guy. If not, find out, Google him, find him, wrote 12 spiritual books. He'd been dead for probably 15 years. That's us back in like probably 19 something, you know, um, 89 or 90, whenever it was. But Og Mandino wrote, the book that you will all know when I say it is The Greatest Salesman in the World, which is not really about selling. It's about serving and it's about 12. He has 12 scrolls where he tell you take a bad habit and make it a good habit. But Og Mandino in his book, Mission Success, and I'm an auditorio guy, I'm, I'm dyslexic, so it's a hard time reading, but I'm really good at listening because it was so hard to read, you had to listen, right? But any, and, then you, and then you perfect that. Well, Og Mandino in his book, Mission Success, there was one little section in one chapter that moved me so well it actually changed my state the first time I listened to it. It's got things like this. Now, this would be an Og Mandino in the book. It says, I will live today as all good actors do when they are on stage, only in the moment. I cannot perform at my best today by regretting my previous acts, regrets, or worrying about the scenes to come. I'll take off my coat and make dust in the world. I realize the busier I am, the less harm I'm after to suffer, the taster will be my food, the sweeter my sleep, the better satisfied I'll be with my place in the world. It goes on and on and on. It's about three minutes long, okay, of this one little section. You know, now I understand the secret of changing the attitudes of others, and that's to change my own. It's got good, good stuff. Like, I'll treat today as a priceless violin. One might draw harmony from it, another discord. Life's the same. If I play it correctly, it'll give forth beauty. If I play it ignorantly, it'll give forth... I mean, just good stuff. And that starts to change my physiology, right? Next thing I do is I read this poem by Rudyard Kipling. Am I familiar with Rudyard Kipling? Okay, another great guy. Famous, famous poem he has called If, right? And it's a great one for realtors. Listen to this. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can dream and not make dreams your master. If you can think and not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. That's what Coach, Wal um, Coach Walden, um, um, the UCLA coach, and I read Kareem's book. And I never had heard this before, but that's what Coach um, uh, Wal Walton wouldn't. Wooden, John Wooden. That's what John Wooden t told Kareem. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat these two imposters just the same. Or how about this one in real estate? If you can bear to hear the truth you spoke and twist at my knaves to make a trap for fools. Or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one, one heap of all your winnings and risk it at one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings. And never breathe a word about your loss. That was 2008, 7 and 8 for me. Okay, it goes on and on and on and on. I mean, I thought about this one when I was showing, showing property when I'd read the F poem. If you can force your heart, nerve, and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone, and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on, right? You know, this is one more property, one more property. In any case, so I'll read that, and my physiology will start to change some more. There's a couple other ones. This is, this is Napoleon Hill. You probably heard of him. He wrote this famous book called Think and Grow Rich. Well, there's a self-confidence formula in there, and I just took it right out of the book, and I'll read that. And then there's another guy, Norman Vincent Peale, and he did a um, kind of a spiritual thing, but he did um, a whole self-confidence formula, and I'll read that one, okay? That will actually change my state. It's part of the routine. 
Um, exercise, remember I told you how important exercise was and that that's the E in the thing. Exercise is like drugs, right? You can, you're depressed, you take a drug, it releases dopamine and serotonin and you feel good, right? But there's always side effects to drugs, right? You exercise, it releases dopamine and serotonin and you feel good. So it's very, very, exercise is, is, is a great thing. All sorts of studies on that if you wanna Google it. People that are depressed, they let them do exercise, give them drugs, do all these different things. Exercise is a great thing. You need to be try to break a sweat every single day. Whether you walk, skip, hop, just do something. Okay, that's why sometimes, you know, when performance is measured, performance improves. When performance is measured and reported back, the rate of improvement accelerates. That's why sometimes these little apps or the Fitbit or something like that, because you're measuring, will help you do it. But you want to exercise. Okay, next thing, um, oh, you know what? It's um, no citizen has a right to be an amateur in the matter of fitness. That's uh, Socrates, so it goes back a long way, right? Um, Plato said in order for a man, he may, back then they meant a man or a woman to succeed in life. By the two means, education and fitness. Next one's diet. Okay, interesting thing on diet and the um, um, metabolic rate that you get from eating breakfast. For the first 25 years of my real estate career, I didn't eat breakfast. And I struggled with weight more than I struggle today with weight. We all kind of struggle with day, weight, right? But, um, but, but as your metabolism slows down. But here's what I found out when I studied that. When you eat breakfast, Okay, you start your metabolism going, and you, there's actually a 400 calorie difference in your favor when you eat. You know, it was almost counterintuitive of it, but I started doing that, and I, I've seen it work a lot, and then you're, you're much more effective, too. Um, and then the last one is sleep, and I put a few of you to sleep, which is very good for you here, but um, uh, sleep. What you want to do is you want to establish um, regular bedtime and wake-up time, and that's been the hardest for me on travel. Because like, you know, I came in last night from San Jose, and then this morning when we got at 8.30ish or so, it was really 6.30, and it, you know, it kind of plays with you. But if you can establish that routine on sleep, there's a great book that I'm listening to right now, um, and I have to look on my phone to give you the exact number, the name of the book, but essentially it's this, stress plus rest equals growth. Okay, I think it's called Peak Performance. It's a great, great book. It's got scientific stuff on that. Sleeping is so important. We've, we've probably neglected it a great deal. That sleep that you get when you actually go to bed, not so much a nap, but that sleep when you go to bed and how your body heals and recovers. So those are some important things. Okay, so I did first one, second one. The, the rest of them I'm pretty fast on. Point number three is be like Johnny Johnson, be like Paul, be humble. Okay, be humble, okay? Just, be, just try to be humble. Um, smile, laugh, have fun. Don't take yourself too seriously. Here's what I've learned, and this is what I told the students. I said this, I said, smugness comes before arrogance, and arrogance is the precursor to disaster. Once you think you know it all, your slide to mediocrity has already begun. Hardest people for me to take care of is someone that's not coachable. Okay, I'm looking for brokers, agents that are coachable, willing to grow, and in alignment with our vision and values, right? That's what all of you are looking for in your group there. So be, be humble. It's even, it's even biblical. Proverbs 16, 18 said pride goes, says pride goes before a fall. There's a bunch of good quotes on, in Proverbs on, on pride or not being humble. Um, John, um, uh, John Madden you know, has, has a little quote there on, on being humble. Uh, there's uh, John Wooden being humble. Number four, and you know what, this, this team here in Austin, all brands, because we're all realtors, we're all part of one family. Paul, the team that you built, and then all these people come in, that's, a, that's been one of my things where you can see people build a great team. I've always said I love what I do largely because who I get to do it with. You see, my mission in life is I help people achieve their goals faster than they would in my absence. So when Paul said, can you come talk here? I go, yeah, I'd love to come talk here because hopefully I can add some value you know, to, to everybody here. But build a great team. You gotta remember this is teams are different. They're, we're all different. You need someone to lead the charge, someone to hold something in reserve, someone to pick a fight, someone to make peace, someone to charge ahead without thinking, and someone to think things through. 
with the team, though, the magic alchemy is when it all comes together. Okay? That's why I tried to build it in Terrell, trying to build it right here. But that's how we had 12 consecutive years of organic market share growth. Because when you take a culture of discipline with an ethic of entrepreneurship, that's where you get the magical alchemy of great performance and sustained results. So build a great team, which everybody's, we're all doing here. A um, few more quotes from um, all these great guys on teams. Number five, provide extraordinary service, duh, right? That just even gets you in the game because it's not just service, right? It's quality, service, convenience, and value. You don't add value, you're not gonna get a fee. They're just gonna go to the, the cheapest one out there, right? And you see, I believe, only my opinion, I believe price is the worst thing to compete on. The reason being, it's the easiest one for your competition to duplicate. Any fool can lower the price. Any fool can cut his commission, right? Anybody can do that. You compete on quality, service, convenience, and value. And the reason being, most people don't do that, right? And ro reason being is because it's hard. I told Paul this earlier this morning, which made me had a top of my head. I said, you know, most people won't do that, or most companies won't do that. And you know why? I said, Paul, because it's hard. And then I told him, but Paul, it's the hard that makes you great. It's the willingness to do the hard that makes you great. It's the willingness to do the hard that separates you from everybody else. Okay? So number five was provide extraordinary service. Um, more stuff on it. Ethics, what we must do. I know you have classes on that. Ethos, what we should do. Uh, here's a great one. This is from the dean of um, Harvard Business School. What service do I provide that my competitors also do, but I do better? What if you asked yourself that and really thought through on it? Okay? Or this question. What service do I provide that none of my competitors do? That's another one. I don't know of too many associations that provide this. Okay? This is cool. Uh, very cool. All right, uh, the golden rule, this is kind of like our real estate thing, right? But in, you know, that's kind of everybody's rule. The golden rule, treat others as, they, as you wish to be treated. In real estate, we gotta do the platinum rule, huh? We need to treat them as they wish to be treated because everybody's kind of different there. All righty, and uh, number six is read or listen. Okay, read or listen. You know, new eyes see old things in new ways. Believe it or not, I traveled so much. In fact, Johnny and I had probably seen each other for breakfast for a month because we were both traveling and I was on vacation and here and there and Stacy, we tried to connect you. You knew I was on vacation a number of times too. But what I was able to do is I was able to listen to like five books in July, which is pretty cool. Now you're better off to listen to the same book five times and really get it down. So usually what I'll do is I'll listen to it one time. If it's really good, I'll go get the hardback and I'll listen to it again and then I'll underline it. For a dyslexic guy, that's kind of what works. But when you read, new eyes see old things in new ways. And if you're rewiring your brain all the time, it's kind of a cool thing to do. There's some great, great books. And everything right now, we're like the Industrial Revolution. Everything through technology is going to change so much in the coming 10 years or so. If you, let me have that. Can I have that phone there, Johnny? If you're not relevant, if you're not relevant on this, now my, my dad's 92 and he's still got his flip phone, he's fine, okay? He didn't, he didn't need to change, okay? He didn't need to change, okay? You're gonna be retired in five years, you're probably okay, but if you're not relevant on this device, okay, you're gonna disappear. You're gonna be a nice bookstore before Amazon got serious. You're gonna be a taxi service or a black car medallion before Uber came, right? So you gotta just be relevant, be relevant. Um, there's some great books on, on, uh, on that too, and there's a great guy to follow, if you don't mind. He kinda, to be authentic, he kinda F-bombs, but um, Gary Vanderchuk, you know, just a very relevant on, on this whole thing, but start paying attention to that. Next time I come back, if, if you do invite me back, it'll be let's just a 20 minute talk on being relevant, and I'll tell you all these crazy things that are gonna come down the line. Okay, and when you come to Summit, I just decided that's what I'm gonna talk about there too. Um, and I only have 20 minutes for that one. So read, okay, um, next one. Oh, look at, she put, she put some books in, God bless Dietra. Here's a great one for you, The Upstarts. This talks about Uber and Airbnb, okay? Um, peak Performance, that was the book I just said I was listening to, okay? 
This is what I'm going through right now. These guys, these are guys are from Salesforce. I'm looking about doing something with Salesforce because they got some great ways to measure stuff. And um, a couple of them are from MIT. And this is a brand spanking new, um, new book that's of the same thing, machine, platform, and crowd. Um, Shoe Dog, Phil Knight, great, great story. Okay. Um, well, this is an interesting one. Good. I, I didn't know I was going to give you all these great books to read. This is... Um, Clint Hill, now get this, he was the Secret Service guy for five presidents. Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford. Okay, got them all. <laughs> um, this, this is pretty interesting on his perspective, okay? And he's the dude that jumped on the back of the car when JFK was assassinated. The whole, his whole perspective was really, really, really good on there. And um, the everything store, you know, Amazon. Wow. You know, there's, um, I was listening to this, uh, uh, well, I was reading this article about the, the C CEO of Mercedes-Benz. He says, look at this. The other car companies aren't our competitors. Our only competitor, Tesla, Google, Apple, and Amazon. Going to put them all out of business. Every car dealership eventually will, will, will go away. You won't even drive. You'll just, on your phone, you'll, you'll dial it up and it'll come get you and then you go. You know? <laughs> it's just strange. If this is not your 14 year old daughter, you know, saying, hey, this, this is real. This is the punchline. Okay? So just be aware. And I'm going to become, I'm possessed now. When I read this book here, and then I saw Gary Vanderchuk for the third time. I've read three of Gary's books. It hadn't hit me yet. It, it was still in my conscious mind. Now I think I got the non-conscious mind working on it. So I'm going to come. And then lastly, continuous improvement, right? Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. I think there's a quote there about Jim Rohn. You know, here's something for you. And we're, we're basically done. Is this, the stationary position is the beginning of the end. If I do not advance, I fall back. If I walk away from any challenge, my self-esteem is forever scarred. And if I cease to grow even a little, I become smaller. So I, my, my message here would be to reject the stationary position because it's always the beginning and the end. Right? Uh, continuous improvement. So Warren, you know the Oracle of Omaha. The single greatest investment you can make in yourself is, is in yourself. That's what Warren Buffett said. And I told you my mom and Warren are like the same age. And my mom and Warren's net worth, $84 billion. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> um, here's what Tom Peters said, excellent firms don't believe in excellence, only in constant change and improvement. Man, you got one right here. Somehow, you guys, it all came together. You got Paul, and he gave me a tour, and he was so enthusiastic. I wanted to sign up as a realtor right here, you know? Um, Jim Rohn, learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. If you work harder on yourself, you'll earn a living. If you work hard on uh, your job, you'll earn a living. If you work harder on your, yourself, you can make a fortune. That's one of my mentors, Jim Rohn. You know? Jim Rohn also told me another little thing before I get to, these were some keystone habits that create small wins. Here's another thing I learned from Jim Rohn. It's always been the philosophy of any company that I've had, and here it is. Don't join an easy crowd where the expectations are lower, where they don't care. The problem with that is you won't grow. Go where the expectations are high. Go where you're challenged to study, to read, to learn, to develop the next skill because it's the challenge that creates the muscle, the mental muscle, the vocal muscle, the actual physical muscle to become better, stronger, wiser, and more unique. And then you know what you can do? You can just give all your money away, right? Because it doesn't really matter. Okay, Keystone Habit Small Wins. I got a couple little things here. Oh, you got some homework for you or I got something else going on. Oh my gosh, this is long. Okay, so here's what you could do. This is the other part of my, my routine. Every day I'm going to write down 10 people or things I'm grateful for. Then I'm going to write down three things that made me happy in the last 24 hours. And I got to tell you, tomorrow morning, I'm going to be talking about this. This made me happy because 95% of you are pretty engaged right now, which is pretty cool you know, and hopefully will make an impact on you. But I learned that from this book, The Happiness Advantage, and then I got a chance to meet Sean Aker, the professor at, at Harvard that wrote the book, and I said, Sean, check it out. In my little journal I made, I put your little thing in there, which was totally cool. Um, then you're gonna program, there's a, there's a, a great one for you if you wanna do it. It sounds weird, 
You know, I see Frank back there. We had our leadership team doing it for like two straight months, right? But in any case, you're going to program the non-conscious portion of your brain, which is servile, which means it sets no goals of its own, doesn't have the merit or the value. So if you made 100 grand last year, I challenge you to write down, I am earning $500,000 in the next 12 months and write it down over and over again. Remember, the non-conscious portion of your brain is servile. It sets no goals of its own. It doesn't judge the merit or the value of the goal. It only tries to carry out that order that you give it. So you're gonna brainwash yourself into doing more, okay? So that's that piece there. Um, the next thing you wanna do, of course, on, on a routine is review your goals. Tomorrow's assignment, if you want to, Write down 10 people you're grateful for, three things that made you happy in the last 24 hours, and program your non-conscious mind. Oh, I was going to end it with this, but I, wasn't there a slide? You got a nice little flyer here, and I don't know where the slide is, and it might be at the very, very end, but, um, and I'll, I'll hit it again there. But I've got some free gifts for you. What happens, I ran into Debbie DeGroat, who I consider to be the best coach in the business, one of the very best coaches in the business, okay? Um, and Debbie happened to be here in Austin, so I ran into her and I said, hey Debbie, come to my little talk here, and by the way, um, there's an admission to come to the talk here, because I just don't talk for free. Uh, Paul, I got, pa Paul got me for free, because he, he's my pal, and, and, and Debbie's my, my pal, but you know, Paul, you know, he got me for free. But so I said, Debbie, what we're gonna do is we're gonna give away, like, $99 of your stuff to everybody. Doesn't it, does it go for about 99 Debbie? Yeah, Debbie's back there. Just stand up for a second and wave, because then you can say hi to her before, okay? Um, so we, we're going to get Debbie's report, how to get business from the people you know. Um, Debbie's report, 89 pages of scripts and audio. And you're going to complimentary, if you want, you can even have a complimentary business strategy coaching call with Debbie, okay? That's a gift to you from Paul and Johnny and me, okay? Um, and I'm going to end it right here. I'm going to end it right here. How many of you like watch Shark, Shark Week? Yeah, okay, you do. Look at how, put her hand right up. Yeah, baby. Um, you know, here's, here's the deal with that. We, we, I always go to Hawaii as our family vacation, and it used to be we, for like three years in a row, we went on Shark Week, and we were always watching Shark Week. And if somebody's seen Michael Phelps, he kind of raced the shark and things like that. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to end this little talk with Paul on the power of a team, because you're such a great team here. And I'm going to take you back in time to the 2008 Olympics. So you got to just rewind to 2008 Olympics. And the whole big talk in the 2008 Olympics, if you can't remember, was can Michael Phelps win eight gold medals? Because it was so impossible for him to win eight gold medals that 10 sponsors said, you know what, we'll give you a million bucks if you can win eight gold medals. Because they did the math like the accountants do, right? They do the math, okay. And the reason being is there was one event that he had to win but it was impossible for him to win because France, in the 4x4 100 relay, had the three fastest swimmers in the world in the 100. So that's, that's, that's the piece there. So that's the power of a team. And so we're back in Beijing, 2008. And we, oh, Debbie, there he is again. Is Debbie still in here? Just stepped out. Oh, no, she's right there. Good, hiding on me. Um, Debbie, just as we all have coaches, Johnny, we all have coaches, right? Um, Paul, we all, it, Michael Phelps is a coach. That's Bob Bowman. That's his coach. Get, get this. Good story behind that dude. He comes in. He's a Baltimore little swim coach. Comes in one day, sees this little kid, seven years old, not winning anything, but says, that kid's got awful big hands. That kid's got an awful long torso. That kid's got kind of short legs that offer less drag in the water. That's how a swim coach thinks, right? Remember? I was winning Cherry Chase. And then he, and, 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 and then, and then he, and he said, um, you know, um, he's, I can make that kid a champion, right? And then he had this whole, it's a whole different talk sometime. I'll tell you about that one and how, how he did that. But it was rather, rather interesting that, that so, so he's got a coach. And then, let's see, what the next slide is this. So he's going to get, can he get that eighth gold medal? Look how young he looks. Now, here's the deal. In a relay, see, Johnny, Johnny ran, ran the relay in, in college, right? The, the, the 440 or the 4x1, four four one. One? yeah, okay. And um, you got an anchor. The anchor, I mean, you familiar with the anchor is in a relay? That's the dude that gets it last, and he kind of hopes he has the lead and then can hang on to the lead, right? That's what the anchor does. That guy's name there is Jason Lezak. He happens to be the oldest swimmer in the Olympics, okay? 
oldest, now if you really got to pee, hold on for two more minutes, okay? Um, <laughs> Jason Lezak is the hold, you know, uh, the, uh, the, I got a P2, the, the oldest swimmer in the Olympics. He's going to swim the anchor. Now he's done it. This is his third Olympics. He even got a bronze one year. That's the third best in the world. That's pretty good, right? Okay. Now, difference, France. In the newspaper that morning, we will smash the Americans. That's what they came here for. All this talk, talk, talk. They have the world record holder a guy by the name of Elaine Bernard. This dude stands six foot five and he can fly. He's scary, get ready to be scared, here he comes. There's Elaine Bernard, okay? That's Elaine Bernard. He's gonna swim the anchor. Now Elaine Bernard holds the world record in the 100, down and back, 47 and a half. In this event, he breaks his world record, okay? He does, I think it was about a 40, a 46 something. So he breaks the world record and he's the anchor. We're gonna pick up this race, if the video works, we're gonna pick up this race. We're gonna pick up it in the third length. So Phelps has already swum, Colin Jones has already swam, and now it's the third. And we got our, we got our, our, our group going. Now, Freddie Biscayne, who went to Syracuse here, but he's from France, he's swimming for the French. He broke the world record in the trial in one of the pre preliminary races. So they got the fastest guy and the next fastest guy and the lead. Watch how he, everybody needs a team. No, we can need voice. Let's stop that for a second. We got to make this work. As such a build up there and not have the, you know, <laughs> you know. And if somehow it's not clicked, well, we tried it though, right? We sampled it, we tested it, so it should work. We'll go back in a second. Just hold on. If it was two minutes before you could pee, now it's three. <laughs> and worst case, I can probably do the play-by-play. -play. It's even more exciting now. <laughs> Remember, Francis mouthed off. Freddie Biscay, 47 has taken over the lead, though, for France. Fastest relay split in history in the prelims for Busquet. He swam over, and then you've got Colin Jones who swam on the prelim relay and earned his spot in this final, but France has taken the lead up there in lane five over the United States. Alain Bernard awaits as the anchor guy, and Jason Lezak is going to have to make up some ground on Alain Bernard, who stands six feet five and can absolutely fly. I just don't think they can do it, Dan. I mean, Jason Lezak has been there how many times in his career has he anchored this free relay and medley relay, but I just don't think he can do it. He's trying to ride that wave as much as possible. Bernard is pulling away from him. Look at the world record level. A three-time Olympian. World record is absolutely going to be shattered here. The United States try to hang out a second. They should get the silver medal. Australia is in bronze territory right now, but Lezak is closing a little bit on Bernard. Can the veteran chase him down and pull off a shocker here? Well, there's no doubt that he's taking that.
fastest in history. In the relays, you have to show heart. It's all about teamwork. So much talked about on Phelps's individual quest in these games, but that was one of the most unbelievable team efforts we've seen in relay Olympic history. And okay, so, so there's, and then, and so what's the message? Well, well, here's the message. You can be the greatest swimmer in the world, right? 23 medals, but you always do better if you got a great coach, and great coaches here, and you got a great team, which, which you do. So I think the, oh, then here you go. This was, um, I knew there was something here, and I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss it, so you're going to get it twice, but you're going to get Debbie's uh, script book, okay? And um, you're going to get... Um, oh yeah, you get Debbie's script book. And if you want to connect with me, I have a, a, um, a public page. Uh, my, my, I have like, I maxed out on the friend page. You know, they get 5,000 friends, but I have a public page and then you can follow me if you want. There's some good stuff in there and, and we can connect. I'd love to hear back from you. It doesn't even have to be, um, it could be an old fashioned handwritten note. If there's something here that kind of helped you, that's kind of, that's kind of gets me going too. If, if there's any impact I've made, um, it's always best because we do, do give these out. It's always best. You can, you can go online to try to get it, but if you can fill this out and then we'll pick it up, we'll send you all that stuff. Debbie will send you all that stuff. And then this is where you kind of find me on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. And, um, I think that's um, that's a wrap for me, Paul. Okay. 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 Tino, thank you. Johnny, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> whenever you're out of town, wear orange, people. Uh, who knows what happens? Um, just, I know. Hold your bladders for just one second. Um, first of all, a great. Uh, um, a, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. It was fantastic. Um, a couple of more tributes. One, I want to acknowledge my team. I want to acknowledge all of the staff that works at the Austin Board of Realtors. Kalea Youngblood is in charge of our professional development. Elkie is in ch a, 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 our supervisor of education. Paul's the guy who got the video working. So all of the staff, if you're still here, just raise your hand. And they are outstanding people that work very hard to try to help you. I want to also acknowledge really quickly anybody who's on the Professional Development Committee. With the Professional Development Committee, please stand and let me recognize them as well. These, these are the people who allowed this, this, this event to happen. It was their commitment and dedication to trying to bring this to you that allowed it to happen. Um, my fortune to meet these folks. Um, again, give the feedback. Uh, get involved with us. Help us be better. Help us create a team that's better every day so that we can make a better city and make better realtors and have realtors that have more success in serving the families that need your help. Thanks for being part of ABOR. I hope you have a great day.